I am going to be talking about both initial staging and evaluation of uh, biochemical recurrence with uh, PSMA targeted pet agents. Um, I do uh, receive uh, research funding from Progenix Pharmaceuticals, which is a relevant disclosure, as some of the data I'm going to show you will actually be with an F18 labeled PSMA agent uh, that has been licensed to Progenix. Of course, we've uh, heard how common prostate cancer is. Uh, it's perhaps a little surprising then that our imaging has lagged uh, behind just how common this disease is and the clinical need for uh, really outstanding imaging. MRI is good in the primary setting, but as we have heard, there are some limitations. And then in the uh, widely metastatic setting, our conventional imaging with CT and bone scan have always been pretty good at showing us widespread disease, but the sensitivity is abysmal in patients with low volume uh, new recurrences. So for all these reasons, uh, we need good molecular imaging of prostate cancer. PSMA is a great target. It's a transmembrane carboxypeptidase. It does tend to be highly expressed on prostate cancer cells. There is cell level heterogeneity, but if you look at uh, uh, pathological series in terms of whole tumor expression, uh, it's about 95% of at least primary prostate cancer tumors will express PSMA. And there seems to be some correlation between aggressiveness and the, the amount of overexpression of PSMA. Uh, the extracellular domain of PSMA has a number of places that you might be able to uh, design small molecules to bind, but the active site tends to be particularly good. Uh, a lot of the data we have is with a, a gallium-labeled lab PSMA agent, most commonly now in the literature called gallium PSMA-11. But there are some practical reasons that you'd actually want uh, F18-labeled radio tracers, and there are now a number of those that have at least reached early clinical development. Uh, I'll be talking most about the one in the upper left, the DCF-PYL. Uh, this is actually just an example with an old F18 labeled radio tracer. It just goes to show if you do have a big high grade tumor uh, in pr uh, the primary setting, it's generally going to show up pretty well. We, we're not going to miss a large uh, tumor with, uh, that's uh, fairly high Gleason grade, it's going to have a lot of PSMA expression. Uh, we did postulate uh, now a couple of years ago that uh, perhaps we could actually see this correlation between. Um, uh, Gleason score and say SUV max, a readout of the amount of uptake in a tumor. Uh, that uh, was always, uh, we, we knew that the confidence intervals here were, were pretty wide and we're kind of waiting for more data to come out. Uh, but, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, we do see uh, often a lack of uptake in areas of BPH uh, in, uh, when we are uh, looking at a primary prostate cancer patient. Uh, this is a little different than say choline and uh, maybe FACBC to a degree. Uh, although every now and then we'll see a BPH nodule, a very obvious BPH nodule uh, that does light up. And uh, there may be something inflammatory about certain BPH nodules that could raise a false positivity, but for the most part, you won't see any uptake in BPH. Uh, but uh, as we have gotten into larger series, uh, this is retrospective data, but, uh, but I think still somewhat compelling that there may be a trend towards higher uptake uh, with uh, more aggressive tumors, but it doesn't quite reach a statistical significance level. So I don't think we're at a point where we're going to have some magical cutoff where we can say uh, below this you don't have clinically significant disease and above this you do. Uh, we've seen this slide a couple of times, uh, really nice data from uh, um, from uh, Matthias Eiber uh, and coworkers, uh, it shows that there's probably additive value of PSMA uh, targeted PET in the context of uh, multi-parametric MRI. Uh, looking outside of the prostate in primary staging, it's interesting, the first paper that came out on this was actually somewhat controversial in that uh, in finding uh, occult nodal metastatic disease, the specificity was essentially perfect. If it lit up on the PSMA-targeted PET, uh, it was real disease uh, when uh, uh, the pelvic lymph node dissection was completed, but the sensitivity was viewed as really suboptimal, so it was reported as 33.3%. Uh, there were a couple of other uh, retrospective studies uh, that were done that generally found sensitivities to be higher than that, uh, around 60% to 70%. Uh, I'll just show you a couple of examples from our prospective single center cohort that looked at this. Uh, and again, this is with an F18 labeled PSMA agent. Uh, we generally would find that uh, it's actually uncommon that we would uh, find lymph nodes uh, in patients that uh, didn't have obvious lymph nodes on CT and MR. Uh, 
Uh, our specificity was a little bit lower than that reported in some of the earlier studies, but sensitivity was at or above uh, what had been seen before. So it leads me to believe that the sensitivity can be in the 60 to 70 percent, but I think you really need very, very experienced readers uh, to be able to achieve that. And uh, some of the multi-center studies that are starting to come out now aren't necessarily finding those same sensitivities. They actually hew a little bit closer to that first paper down in maybe the 40 percent range. Uh, but there's something to the scan besides just sensitivity and specificity in this context. And I think this is important and I hope that this story kind of unfolds in the coming years. If you take patients that are negative on the scan, positive at pathology versus positive on the scan and positive at pathology, the patients that are positive on the scan are going to do worse. They're going to have a shorter biochemical recurrence-free survival. And I think that just speaks to the fact that if you're detecting it on the scan, it's probably higher volume disease, and they have more chance of having additional disease sites that you don't appreciate. Uh, moving on to biochemical recurrence, number of retrospective studies in the, in the BCR setting, uh, again, primarily with gallium. Although in some of these studies, uh, these patients aren't necessarily biochemically recurrent in the pure sense. Uh, many of them are actually uh, metastatic, and they had evidence of metastases on, say, CT or bone scan. So uh, I think we have to take uh, all of this data a little bit with a grain of salt in the sense that you can kind of dope in as many overtly metastatic patients as you want, and you can sort of make your sensitivity almost anything that you want it to be. So the real sort of value proposition for molecular imaging and PSMA specifically is uh, how about those patients where we don't see anything on conventional imaging where and how many of those patients are we going to find sites of disease? I'll just show you a, a few examples from uh, our own experience. Uh, this was a 30-study, uh, 30 30-patient 30 uh, prospective single-center study that we carried out. And you can see here that uh, among these patients, there's maybe one outlier with a relatively high PSA in the low 20s, but our median PSA was 0.4. So we're very much down in these patients that we suspect would have low-volume disease. They've just recurred. And uh, so hopefully we'll be able to find something in at least a reasonable percentage of them uh, and potentially inform decision making. Uh, here's uh, just uh, sort of where the PSAs were in a graphical sense. Uh, so our sensitivity for any site of disease was uh, about two-thirds of patients uh, would, uh, were found to have uh, evidence of at least one site of disease consistent with prostate cancer on the PET. Here's just a couple of examples. This is a local recurrence. See, it can be a little hard to tease out from the bladder activity, but uh, confirmed by MRI in this case. Uh, this is actually the most common thing we see is one or two uh, small lymph nodes in the pelvis uh, below size criterion for uh, uh, being pathologically enlarged. And then here's an example of a gentleman who has uh, one of these small pelvic lymph nodes. Uh, what's interesting about him is that if you look at where his salvage radiation therapy field would have been, this lymph node is outside of the salvage field. So it's in that uh, blue area there, whereas the salvage shield would, is the, the yellow area that covers the prostate bed. So our radiation oncologist actually did include a boost to that area that was outside of the traditional salvage field. A uh, patient came back six months later, had a repeat PS, uh, PSMA scan, uh, and did not have any evidence of disease. And a couple of years later now, he uh, still has an undetectable PSA. Of course, this raises the idea, what do we do with, say, oligometastatic disease? So those patients that are found to have small volume, one or two sites of disease outside of what we would normally be treating with salvage radiation therapy. Uh, here's a patient with a presacral uh, site of recurrence. Uh, he got SBRT to this, no systemic therapy, scan finding went away, and his PSA became undetectable. But we don't see this all the time. Sometimes we have a patient where we think we have maybe one sided disease on conventional imaging. We wind up imaging them with PSMA and they have disease everywhere. We don't see this commonly, but it happens every now and then. Certainly not appropriate for focal therapy. And then sometimes we have sort of an intermediate case. We have a couple of sites of disease. Uh, this patient has uh, some evidence of uh, recurrent disease in the pelvis and also in the retroperitoneum. He also got SBRT. But as you can see, he actually failed that. So uh, he wound up uh, developing a number of other sites of disease on a follow-up scan. They were presumably there as micrometastatic prior to receiving SBRT to his visible sites of disease. So I still think we have a long way to go in sort of figuring out who's really going to benefit from metastasis-directed therapy, what are the cutoffs in terms of number of sites of disease or, or volume that we can effectively treat this way. <laughs> 
And that's generally been the, the case in what's reported in the literature. This is some retrospective data. You pretty much always get local control of the disease, but again, some patients are harboring disease that you can't see on the initial scan. Uh, and we do have a prospective study uh, led by Dr. Fu Tran at our institution uh, that uh, should be published in the near future uh, that uh, found very similar things. And then uh, this, uh, I always like, uh, like this paper. This is uh, from uh, Declan Murphy. Uh, the sort of Pokemets uh, ideas, you know, how, how often do you play whack-a-mole? Where, where do you sort of call it quits? Uh, when do you realize you just cannot possibly get every metastasis? Uh, and there is an interesting trend uh, that uh, uh, Declan reported on that uh, the PSMA-targeted pet literature has exploded with sort of the oligometastatic or metastasis-directed therapy literature. Uh, and then there are, there are false positives. No scan is perfect, of course. Uh, so you do have to be able to sort of manage uh, kind of pitfalls uh, in interpretation. Uh, and so uh, we, we proposed a method to do that. There are a couple of other methods out there to do that that sort of uh, measure your confidence that a site of uh, uptake on the scan is really a site of cancer and whether you need to focally treat that. So uh, sensitivity of uh, PSMA-targeted PEP for uh, occult nodal disease initial staging uh, seems like it may be limited, but I think there's, again, information in the scan uh, outside of sensitivity and specificity. So we really have to learn how to use the scan as a biomarker for predicting how patients are going to do. And then uh, I think that uh, PSMA-targeted PET does have a high sensitivity for current disease, but exactly what to do with that information in the oligometastatic setting, uh, I think we still have a lot to learn as well. Uh, and with that, I'll wrap up. And and uh, uh, just uh, notice, uh, uh, make a quick note of all the people I work with, and uh, if there's time, happy to take a quick question.